Good morning. Thank you uh, all for uh, letting me share with you my perspective on privatized banking, infinite banking. And um, one thing you're going to see about my slides is that I don't know how to use PowerPoint. So you're just going to have to roll with me that my slides are not going to have movement and all this cool stuff. Actually, my, a couple of my slides do, but that's because of Stan. So I'm going to give Stan credit where credit is due. Okay, you'll, you'll be able to see the, the, the slides that I created and the ones that, that, uh, that Stan and Joe took and, and, and uh, made them really nice. But like Joe said, we're from uh, South Dakota. We live in South Dakota half of the time in, in Naples, Florida. My wife is from Naples, Florida. So when people meet her in, in South Dakota, they say, how did you ever get her to move here? Well, it's because we didn't have a house in South Dakota. She wouldn't be there. But... Um, and we, we, uh, I started doing wealth management, financial planning, 22 years old, right out of school, and I did the traditional financial planning. I, I taught people how to invest in the market, you know, dollar cost averaging, diversify, you know, um, all of this stuff. And, and we, had, we had a firm in Denver for 20 years, 37 advisors running around, and we had two corrections. 2001, 2008, and what happened? We started doing the math on what we're really earning on our money. We thought there's got to be a better way, right? I mean, the people that we knew that had a lot of money, they were what? They owned their own business. Really wasn't, I mean, we have a lot of doctor clients. Again, we live in South Dakota. If we look out our back door, we see Nebraska, okay? So we're right on the Missouri River, and Nebraska has state income tax. And then if we look left, about a mile, we see Iowa. And Iowa has state income tax. So where do you think all the doctors live? In our neighborhood, right? So good or bad, we don't really have to go to the doctor. We just call them and say, hey, um, send us an antibiotic, or can we come by the house? And, and uh, well, that's good. But these doctors, we work with them a lot. They don't really understand money. What we say is the average American gives up over $2 million of wealth over their lifetime. A doctor is about five. So, um, but, they, is any doctors in the room, by the way? Okay, all right. So, is that true? Absolutely. Probably more, right? And it's because they're targets, right? Doctors are targets. So, this is really good because you've got to teach people how to think about money. And so... Um, you know, you really, there's different things that people do. Now, Robert Kiyosaki, anybody familiar with Robert Kiyosaki? Rich dad, poor dad, right? Now, Kiyosaki says, savers are losers. Now, that's kind of, he's, he's pretty bold about things. He'll say, your house is not an asset, because assets do what? Make you money. Does your house make you money? No. Okay, so savers, they seek compound interest, high risk, high return. We're going to talk about that. They buy term insurance. They pay cash, or they use debt. Right? So when they pay cash, they have lost opportunity costs because that money could have been somewhere else earning them money. And when they use debt, they pay interest. Right? So there's no escape. There's no exceptions. That's it. You have lost opportunity costs or you pay interest if you're a saver. So their debt is non-deductible. They work for a paycheck. So they, if you think about this for a second, and Robert Kiyosaki says, if you work for, your, if you work for money, you pay the highest taxes right? If your money works for you, you pay lower taxes. And if you use somebody else's money, you pay even lower taxes or maybe even no tax, right? Now think about that. How, does that sound good? Use somebody else's money and pay no tax. Everybody on board with that? Okay. So they rent the banking function. Now this is so important because someone in your life is going to be the banker. They're going to play the banker. I know this sounds simple, but it might as well be you, right? Because is there any transaction, any financial transaction you've ever had in your life where the bank wasn't the winner? Anybody come up with anything? No. The bank, anybody own a bank? Commercial bank? We, do you? Yeah, we do too. And uh, in South Dakota, we own a small part of it. But yeah, don't get that excited, honey. You know? <laughs> so... Um, Kelly just wants to know if she can go down to the bank and get some money. No, just kidding. Um, but commercial banks, if you think about it, everybody that works in the bank, how many people that work in the bank know how the bank makes money? Zero. 
That's not their job, right? Okay, so you, you have to control the banking function. Growth is taxable. They pay the highest fees. They pay hidden penalties, right? They give up liquidity control, and their saving cash takes a long time, and they have toxic loans, right, well, which we'll get into. Now, wealth creators, they think more like banks. They think like business owners. They use velocity of money. Has anybody heard that term, velocity of money, right? Okay, we're going to talk about that a little bit more and show you how that actually works. They own bank-owned life insurance. They invest for guarantees. How would you like to have an investment where 80, 85, 90, or 90% 90 or more of what you're, what you're projected to earn is guaranteed? Wouldn't that be cool? I mean, that's what we need to do. We use other people's money. I like to ask this question when I'm dealing with my clients is, if I would loan you $100 million right now today, but in a year you had to give me $4 million of interest, right? You could give me the $100 million back or you can just keep it, keep using it, but you got to pay me $4 million. Would you take the money? If you say no, then we got to, we got to, we got we to gotta get you going. Now, as mo most people in the room are business owners, right? So most people would say, yeah, because I got a year to figure out how to make eight million bucks with my hundred million, because I only have to pay you four and I made four, right? That's a good deal to me. So we want our debt to be tax-free. We want liquidity, use and control, positive rate of return, tax deferred or tax-free, right? We want growth, no fees, no fees, that sounds good. No penalties, a long track record. How about over 200 years? How long has the federal income tax been in place? 104, 105 years? How about 250 years or more? Um, leverage. Everybody, I mean, leverage is the key to making money, right? If, I, if you write me a check for 10 grand, and I, uh, and I turn around and write you a check for 20 grand, how many times a day do you want to do that? Every day, all day, right? Okay. So we want leverage. Unstructured loans. What does unstructured loans mean? That means we're in control, right? Interest only. How many people in the room, if most business owners or a lot of business owners that I work with, they have a line of credit, interest only. Can the bank change that, those terms, by the way? Absolutely. Then they might have an equipment loan, right? That's normally not interest only. But what if all the loans that you ever got were guaranteed contractually to be interest only, unstructured, from this point forward for your business? And every dollar that came into your business could flow through that. Would, would that make you feel more comfortable, more in control of your business? Again, own the banking function. I mean, that's, it's all about control, right? So let's back up to the beginning. Where did we learn what we learned about things like money? How many people heard when they were kids, money is the root of all evil, right? I mean, I, I, didn't, I mean, my, 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 my dad drove a trash truck, my mom worked in a casket factory. What I learned about money was nothing. I taught myself and people like Joe Pantozzi taught me about money. And knowing people like that, Joe's been in the business over 40 years of teaching people how to create wealth the right way. So how about the stock market? Where did we learn about the stock market? From salespeople? Does that sound like a good idea? Where do we learn about how the car business works? From salespeople, right? I mean, how about taxes? How many people had classes in, in high school or college on taxes and how to pay less tax? Nobody? Financial education? Uh, Andrew, there you go. <laughs> uh, Financial education. Robert Kiyosaki, again, likes to say we get a lot of schooling in this country, but not a lot of education. Your ability to create wealth is based on your financial education. Increase your financial education, learn more, and you'll be wealthier. Absolutely. And then how about banking? I mean, we all had a class that told us how, to, how banks work, right? And how we were going to use the bank's money to make more money and how the banks were going to 
get 26 times what we get on our money, right? Do you guys remember that class? I didn't go to that school, I guess. Okay. So we didn't learn it in school. Did our parents teach us? No, what do our parents teach us? They teach us what they were taught, right? Okay. We didn't learn about these things in school. Now, like I said, remember I, I, I tried to set you up and brace you for my lack of good uh, graphics, okay? But this basically says knowledge does not equal understanding, right? This says knowledge transfer machine. That's not how it works. Unfortunately, that'd be really cool. And, uh, you know, someday we'll look back and we'll look at sitting people in a classroom for eight hours a day and teaching them that that's really probably not the best way to learn, right? And now with Google and things like that, I mean, you could get a, you could get a, a, a master's degree in a subject for, in, online for free. Okay, Robert Kiyosaki. If, if you can't tell, uh, we're fans of Robert Kiyosaki because he teaches you how to think like the rich people think instead of thinking like uh, middle America and poor people think. He says most people are poor because they are taking financial advice from salespeople instead of rich people, right? So I love this quote. What gets us in trouble is not what we don't know. It's what we know for sure that just ain't so, right? So in economics, there's really the scene, what they want you to see. Who's they? The government, banks, Wall Street, financial services industry to some degree. They want you to see what's above the surface. But what they don't want you to see is the unseen, the 26 to 1 ratio, what they're doing with the money. What they want to focus on is, hey, we're giving you interest on your money. And, and we say, okay, but what are they doing with it? What could we be doing with it? Now, you think of Joe's slide, and he says that they're paying us 0.2, and we're paying them 5.2. Now, think about that. They're paying us 0.2, we're paying them 5.2. Interest expense, what they pay us. Interest uh, income, what we pay them. So, um, I think it was Shakespeare that said, if you understand the players in the play, you'll know what's going on. So, you have three entities. Infinite banking, to me, in a nutshell, is to just be all three of those entities. Just be all three of those players in the play. Sounds pretty simple. But you've got to be the banker, because the banker is the best one, right? So, all right. Another way to look at this. By the way, this is Stan did these graphics. Could you guys tell how that went from, like, really poor graphics to really cool graphics? Um, so this is common knowledge, everything above the surface. And below the surface is uncommon knowledge. Okay? Now, most of the people in this room are business owners. Is your income common or uncommon? Uncommon, right? I'm not talking about what you report to the IRS that you make. I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, it's uncommon. So why would you have common strategies to build your wealth? Right? Why would you give your money to a money babysitter and let them try to grow it? You wouldn't. But we like to stand in this line, the reassuring lie line. Now, why? It's human nature. It's human nature. It's, it's hey, I might, you know, it feels like I'm doing the wrong thing, but everybody else is doing the wrong thing, too. So if we're, if we're all going down, we're all going down together. I mean, has anybody ever felt like that? I have. To stand over here in this reassuring lie, or inconvenient truth line, okay, that takes courage. It takes courage to change your perspective on this. You have to know that you're doing the right thing. So like Joe said earlier, you got to know it because you know the math, right? Not because you think, well, Joe, it's Joe's opinion and Joe's smarter than my other advisor, right? And so we got to get out of that reassuring lie line because it's going nowhere. How do we do that? We've got to change our paradigm. So this is the definition of a paradigm. When you're thinking or doing, something is replaced by a new and different way. It's pretty simple, right? But Einstein said simplicity is elusive. Because simple doesn't mean easy. Because we've got to change the way we think. Now, the thing I like to think about is, what's the 
probably one of the biggest paradigms on, on Earth, is when a chicken is hatched. Now think about before the chickens hatch, all you see is this white, it's tiny, it's, 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 uh, it's a small little universe. After that, it's, it's this huge inter universe. So when we think about money, we want to change your paradigm. Pretty simple, but not easy. So if some authoritative power distributed all the money in the world equally among all the people in the world, within 10 years' time, 97% of all the money would be under the control of 3% of the people. Okay, that's, that's a quote from Nelson Nash in this book, Becoming Your Own Banker. How many people have read Becoming Your Own Banker? Excellent. I would recommend everyone else that hasn't read that book to get with Alpha Omega and read that book. Now, you might disagree with this quote or this, these percentages because it might be closer to 99% of the wealth would be under con the control of 1% of the people. But the biggest question is, why would that happen? I mean, if we distributed all the money equally, why wouldn't everybody be able to hold on to the money they had? Well, they, they, the banks, I'm sorry, the banks and, the, and the, the banks, the government, Wall Street, they know how to do what? To get money to flow to them instead of away from them, right? Let's see. I mean, if these shades were open, this might, this might be a clue to the next, uh, answer to the next question. Who else is really good at get, being able to get money to flow to them instead of away from them, right? I mean, we're in Vegas. Normally what I would say is, what's the nicest building in every town? And people in the middle of Iowa would say the bank. But not here, you can't say that, right? Here it's the casinos. But they know how to get money to flow to them. So most of us, throughout our lives, we're taught to make more money, like Joe said, slow down the flow away from us, you know, pay less taxes, um, uh, you know, get out of debt, do all these things, slow down the flow away. But how many of us know people that just seem to be able to have money flow to them? You don't know a lot of them, but you know a few, right? And you're like, what are they doing? What are they doing? What do they know that I don't know that just gets this money to flow to them consistently? Okay. Well, we have to accept some truths. You finance everything you buy, you either give up interest or you pay interest, like I said earlier. There are no exceptions. You give up interest or you pay interest. That's it, right, when we're using our money. So again, we want to learn how to get the money to flow to us because we want to be part of that 1% or 3% that's going to control 97 to 99% of the wealth, right? Is there anybody that doesn't want to be in there? Because Joe will show you, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, okay, I said Wall Street was really good at getting money to flow to them, right? And I've asked this question in front of a lot of people, but how many people in the room have a 401k or a qualified plan? If I said, could you write on your piece of paper right now all of the fees that you're paying inside of that plan? No? How about insurance? Could you buy insurance on that? I mean, if you owned real estate, you could buy insurance, right? Can you buy insurance on your 401k? No. How about uh, your business? Does anybody here not have business insurance that owns a business? Right? I mean, wherever you hold your wealth, you want to protect it. So let's see what's really happening with your money in the stock market. Okay, now I'm going to, start, I'm going to again, go back to the beginning. So your savings and investment in your investment dollars, if they're in the stock market, we know that it's important to earn a decent rate of return. And with the Fed artificially holding interest rates next to nothing, chances are you're taking some risk with your money. So conventional wisdom tells us what? The more risk, the bigger the reward, right? So let's look at this. This is what they sell us on. They sell us on these beautiful charts that in 1926, if we put in a dollar, in the small stocks, small company stocks, we'd have almost $27,000 in 2016. And we think, well, that's 12%. We're averaging 12%. They don't talk about, like Joe said, in the beginning, in, in the 70s, Wall Street did what? They figured out a way to get our money automatically from our paychecks. So what did, all this money went into Wall Street because people didn't put money in Wall Street. They had pensions before that. So all this money 
flowed into Wall Street. What happens when you capitalize something? It grows, right? Then we had the tech boom and bust, right? Take the 80s and 90s out of this chart and see what happens. Doesn't look pretty, okay? But what if those charts have nothing to do with how much money we actually earn? I mean, can it be that there's a huge disconnect between the average return? Now, that's what our broker, our financial planner, our money babysitter sells us on in the actual rate of return that we earn. I mean, could there be a huge disconnect? Let's look closer. So think about it like this. You have a $1,000 investment that's guaranteed to average 25% over the next four years. Sounds great, right? How much money do you expect to have in four years? Anybody? Just a guess? Well, if you have 1,000, it's going to earn 25% average over 24 years. At the end, 1,000? Okay. Anybody else? Okay. All right. By the way, if I offered you, we're going to look at the numbers here in just a second. If I offered you this investment today, would you put money in it? That you're guaranteed to average 25% over the next four years. All right. You think, yeah, absolutely, I'll put money in it. So let's look at how it performed. You know, using some grade school math, it's natural to expect that the investment would play out like this. Each year we'd earn 25%. That's 100%. And our numbers were pretty close. Our $1,000 would grow to almost $2,500. Exactly as you expected. Perfect, right? But let's look at it another way. The market doesn't always perform as we expect. And alternatively, we can average 25% like this. The first year, we earn 100%. The second year, we lose 50%. The third year, we earn 100% again. In the fourth year, we lose 50%. Here's our chart. You add up all these numbers, it's 100% divided by 4, that's 25% average. We started with 1,000, we end with 1,000. Before we paid our broker, right? So what's the point? Average has nothing to do with actual. Nothing. The average rate of return of the gray line and the navy line are exactly the same. Both lines averaged 25% over four years. One, we end up with almost 2,500 bucks. The other one didn't grow at all. How many people that said that they have a 401k that you look at your statement and you think, it's only going up by the amount of money that I put in there? Right? I mean, does anybody just think, man, this thing is just growing better than I expected? People that are their own bankers in this room, after four or five years, how many of you thought, this is better than I thought it was going to be. I get clients say that all the time. Okay, so they started with 1,000 if you're on the Navy line and they ended with 1,000. But they average 25% per year. So how would this translate into the real world? Because in the real world, you know, um, hindsight's 2020, right? Oops. So the next example, I'm going to use the history of the market. On a $100,000 investment this time, and I'm going to use the S&P 500 with dividends. Now, by the way, did you know that 96% of, of money managers don't beat that index? Now, think about that. 96% don't beat it. So why would you pay somebody if you could just have that index? Right? Okay, so we're going to go from 2006 to 2015. Why? Because I told you I can't build these charts very well, so I haven't updated my chart. But if you do the math, and I went from 2007 to 2016, the results are worse. Okay? Right? The results are worse. And you know, why? And you'll see in a minute, it's because of the sequence of returns. Having a negative early in the sequence will have a bigger adverse effect on the result. Okay? I'll explain what I mean in a second. Now, we're going to ignore any fees or taxes for now. We're only going to be comparing the average to the actual. So between 2006 and 2015, the average was 9.14%, right here. Only one down year, by the way. Now, it was a doozy. I, I get it. But only one down year. So our $100,000 should have grown to $239,000 the way that our financial advisor explains it. 
You know, I mean, that's what they show you to sell you, right? Here's your 9.14 average. You would have $239,000. But if you take $100,000 and you multiply it by this rate of return each year, you only end up with 202000 So where'd my 239 go? I mean, it's $37,000 less than my advisor just told me I was getting. There's no rounding error. It's 16% less total than the average rate of return. Okay. Now, wrap your mind around this. This is from John Bogle, who is uh, the founder of investor-owned Vanguard funds. Everybody heard of Vanguard funds? Surprise, the returns reported by mutual funds aren't actually earned by mutual fund investors. Does your broker ever bring that up? No. Now, by the way, it wasn't lost, it wasn't stolen, it never existed. It's just what you were sold on. So if we take $100,000 and we end up with 202 over 10 years, our rate of return is 7.3, not 9.14. Now, it's only 16% less. I mean, our, our, you know, I mean, my advisor took me to play golf. I mean, she's a friend of mine. I mean, I, I, I like her. I mean, she's, she's really nice to me, okay? If that was the only factor, it wouldn't be that bad. But we don't live in a utopia. There's some other factors, right? Who else is on your payroll, right? Your money advisor, your financial advisor, planner, broker? Well, let me tell you about them. They're awesome. He or she, they're the best money babysitter ever. So needless to say, they have to be well compensated, right? Okay, so let's look at how well compensated. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna continue with this same investment, $100,000, we're going to assume a 1% assets under management fee and 0.5 internal fees. By the way, everybody in this room that has a 401k, I'm almost bad. I mean, could I be wrong, Joe, if I said that every single person is paying more than that? And take like Morgan Stanley. To get 1%, you have to have 500,000, maybe 750 to get 1%. If you look at their standard uh, uh, fee arrangement, Okay, so one and a half percent is all. There goes another 27 grand. Well, I didn't really, I mean, you know, going golfing with my broker, I mean, it doesn't really, $27,000. I mean, and if she's only going to beat the, only 4% of them beat the index, what am I doing, right? There's 26% again now that I've lost after the fees. So let's rewind for a second, but again, Robert Kiyosaki, it's not how much money you make, it's how much money you keep, how hard it works for you. And like Joe said about the family, how many generations can you keep this money for, right? So we're sold to average, but we don't earn average. We earn the actual, which is not what we're sold, and we don't even get to keep that. Sound good? Not to me. Now look at this. Now this is this actually this chart I think is actually really good. <laughs> the graphics are amazing on this chart, right? Uh, Cameron, what do you think? Pretty amazing, yeah. Okay, so we were sold this 239. This is our actual rate of return minus the fees 175. Now think about that. We're sold 139 thousand dollars of growth, and we've almost given up half. The investment only grew 75 grand. That's enough to make you scream, right? But let's, at this point, we're at 5.77%. Because if we start with 100, we end up with 175. Our rate of return, the real average rate of return is 5.77. But we're forgetting something. What am I forgetting? Oh yeah, Uncle Sam wants your money. Now, by the way, you might say, I got my money in a qualified plan, so I'm not paying any taxes. I got bad news for you. Okay, so you can't avoid taxes, whether it's a qualified retirement plan or taxes postponed. More importantly, the tax is postponed, but the tax calculation is postponed. Now, wait a minute. Are you telling me that the government would expect me to put money in something for 20, 30, 40 years, and they're not even going to tell me what the tax consequence is when I start to take it out? That can't be right, can it? 
Joe, is that right? Absolutely, right? They don't tell you what it is. But do we think taxes, back to Joe's point in the beginning of the presentation, are taxes going up or down? Up. So it's going to be worse for us, right? Okay. So the IRS is going to get a piece of this, one way or the other. So let's add taxes. Let's pretend that it's non-qualified. 60% is taxed at an ordinary tax rate of 25%. Anybody paying over 25%? Yeah, okay, 40% is taxed at 15% capital gains, okay? Taxes are gonna change, I'm just throwing out round numbers. There goes another $36,000. Now, if you look at this, my money grew from 100,000 to $139,000 in 10 years. That's 3.36%. What do you think of your return now? Look at this, look at this backward correction. These eroding factors of my wealth if I put my money in this. Again, you gotta love John. John says, do you really want to invest in a system where you put up 100% of the capital, you the mutual fund shareholder take 100% of the risk and you get 30% of the return? You wouldn't do that in your business, would you? So understand what just happened. First, you saved up $100,000. Like Joe said, most people don't have that much in their retirement accounts. Then your savings, you, you left it 100% exposed to the stock market. You didn't touch it, you didn't use it, you didn't benefit from it at all. And your reward, 3.3%. Pretty good? No. We're only able to hang on to 39,000. We gave up over $63,000 of the actual return. So the question is, is this a game that you can win? No, you'd be better off taking that 100 grand across the street and, and I mean, you got a chance then. We know you don't have a chance here. Is this the game you should play with your hard earned cash? Not me. Robert Kiyosaki, again, it's not how much money you make, but how much you keep, how hard it works for you, and how many generations you can keep it for. How many people think that sounds like a better plan than the stock market? Absolutely. Okay. Now, this is where, could it get worse than that? I mean, could it get worse than that? Let's see if we can make it worse than that. These things, right? The government. How many people have ever given government control of their money and it worked out well for you? Nobody? Okay, me neither. So let's put our money in a qualified plan and see if we can make it worse. And I'm only going to ask you three simple, easy questions to see if this is a good idea. First question. There's no 401k person getting up here later, Joe, is there? Because they're going to, I mean, I, don't, I, don't want, I want an escort going to the restroom. Um, you know, I, they might try to take me out. <laughs> All right, so is this a good idea? I'm going to ask you three questions. First question. Do you believe your tax burden? Now, remember, they can play around with rates, but your burden, is it going up, down, or is it staying the same? See that graphic? That's pretty good, right? Okay, that's fancy too. Okay, taxes are going up. We know that. Do you think that the dollars in your pocket today are worth more today or in the future? Today. Here's a great way to think about this. How many candy bars could you buy for a dollar when you were a kid? Now, for me, it was around five to 10. So that you can always tell how old somebody is when, when they say that. These young guys say two, and you're going, oh, you're too young, right? 24 for, uh, for Joe back there, that's awesome. That's awesome. Now, that's more, I was, gonna, I was gonna say 10, so you can kind of tell. The big candy bars too, right? Yeah. How many can you buy today? Not even one. So the dollars, this is just an example, the dollars in your pocket are always worth more today than in the future. Right? Last question. Again, you've got to remember South Dakota, Iowa. All right, we're going to give you a farming question. Would you rather pay tax on the seed, the little amount, or on the harvest, the big amount? The seed, right? The little amount, right? By the way, if you pay tax on the seed now, you get all the corn tax-free. 
pretty good, right? Okay, so vi qualified plans like IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, they violate all the questions you just answered. But what are we told to do by the government, by Wall Street, by the financial entertainers, Susie and Dave on the radio and on TV, telling us, put your money in the 401k, that's the best place that you can hold your money, right? Financial entertainers, you know one thing they'll never do that Alpha Omega Wealth will do is sit down and work with you one-on-one -on -one and coach you to wherever you are to somewhere better in the future. They'll coach you. They'll hold your hand. They'll show you how to do this step by step. Dave's not going to do that. Dave Ramsey, everybody doesn't know who I'm saying by Dave. Susie Orman, no. They'll come on the Today Show. They'll do their little uh, dancing monkey tricks, but they will not help you. They will not sit down with you and hold your hand. So a lot of you are business owners. So let's look at this banking function like a business. Okay? Now, how many businesses use compound interest? You just put the money, set, set it somewhere, and it just grows. No? No business? Okay. So let's use the doctor again. So when, when, you, when a patient comes in and they sit on the exam table, right, you, you, uh, you analyze them. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to butcher the uh, vernacular here. You, you find out what's wrong. You, you tell them, here's your treatment plan. They get up. Nurse comes in, rips off the, uh, the exam paper on the table. Somebody else sits down. That's a turn, right? The more turn, the more money you make. If we're building buildings, the more buildings we build, that's a turn. The more money we make. Every business owner in this room operates under turns, not compounding interest. Their money is constantly in motion. And Stan's going to go through an example of actually how that money flows in his businesses, and it's going to be really eye-opening to show you how you guys can use this too. But every business works on turns. So let's look at our business. We're going to start a business today. Okay? It's a banking business. So the turns are what? Loans, right? And it's a small business. So to keep the doors open, we only have to put in $10,000. Okay? So the first year I put in 10 grand and I'm going to have $6,000 to use. Did I have a good first year? If I put a million dollars in a McDonald's, I can't take 600 grand out the first year, right? So it's not bad. Next year I put in 10,000. That's my my total investment. I can take out 8. Uh, not, not bad. The business is getting better. How about in the third year I put in 10, I can take out 10. Every dollar I put into the business, I can take out and use. Looks better, right? From the fourth year and beyond, every dollar I put in, I can take out more than a dollar. And it only gets better every single year, guaranteed. If this was your business model, how many times would you hang your open for business sign? All day long, right? Because the average small business takes three to five years to make money. We're doing it just on the vehicle that we're going to hold our money in in a few years. Great. But remember, I said this was a banking business, so we've got to put that money in motion now. So this $10,000 that we put in, we have $6,000 available, and we happen to owe $6,000 on a visa. So we're going to take that money, and we're going to pay off the visa, and that $500 a month that was going to somebody else's bank, we're going to pay it back to our bank. Pretty simple. All we did was take over what? The banking function. We got rid of the banker. The next year I put in 10. Now I said I would have 8, but I recaptured, and I re recaptured control of this money, right? I recaptured all the interest that I was going to pay the bank. So I could use that money again, right? So now I have the six plus the eight that I have from the second year's deposit, I have 14. I happen to have a car loan, $14,000. I'm paying $1,000 a month on it. So I pay that off, and that $1,000 a month that I was perfectly happy and willing to give to the bank, I pay it back to myself. So I recapture $12,000. 
Next year I put in 10. I said I would have 10 plus the 12 that I, have to, that I can use again. I have 22. Well, I have an inventory loan for $22,000 and I'm paying 2,000 bucks a month on it. Pay off my inventory loan and I take that 2,000 bucks a month and I pay it back to myself. Now I've recaptured $24,000 of money, of control of the money that was gonna go to somebody else, okay? Next year I put in 10, I said I would have 11, plus I can use my 24 again, and I can use my 35. Now, so I mean, I have a, I'm sorry, I have a total of 35 to use. So understand what just happened. I put in $40,000 and I was able to use 77,000. Not because my vehicle was the greatest investment of all time, because of what? My behavior. Me taking over the control of the banking function. Now, if I said to you in your business, you could put $40,000 through this system and you could use 77. How many people want to do that? Would you want to add a zero? A couple zeros? Right? So remember that when we do this, we're taking back control. Whoever controls the money makes the money. Right? Now, by the way, this is just a, an example of how it's working. You, you know, your, your loans might be longer than one year, whatever, to make, for simplicity purposes, I'm making it all paid back in a year and everything else. But you can get how it works. And by the way, what we try to do, when I'm trying to show people this, it's like if I were showing you a photograph. I'm gonna blow up that photograph as big as I can to show you the details, to show you what's really happening. Now here's an example of that, is let's say that you had a penny and it could double every single day, right? 100% compounding every single day for 31 days. Okay, how much money do I have after 31 days? $10,700,000 and some change, right? Now that's pretty good. If that, I know that's extreme, but think about this. What if on day 22, when I have about $21,000, I gotta go buy a new car? I take my 21 grand, I go buy a new car. What happens to my compounding? Starts over, right? It has to start over. Again, I know that's an extreme example, but that's what's happening, is our compounding is being interrupted every day by buying things with somebody else, using somebody else as our banker. Okay, now, if this system sounds complicated, it's not. It's as simple as this. You write checks to you instead of writing checks to the bank. And the more that you use it, it's an ever-increasing pool of money for you, your family, and your business. Because just like I, sh the more that we recapture dollars that are going somewhere else, the interest, the more that we recapture that interest, and we could use it again and again and again, that's creating velocity of money. All right. There's only one product in the world that'll do what I'm telling you it needs to do. Now, this is a line for the wealth creator that we talked about. You have to have guaranteed growth, uninterrupted every day, and then what you're going to do is you're going to borrow money from that account or against that account, okay, using that account as collateral, and you're going to pay yourself back principal and interest. Okay? Now remember, think about this for a second. This is not an investment. This is something that I benefit from immediately. It's not sitting there for 10 years. So I put in 10,000, I said I was gonna lose liquidity of four. I had six to use. Now, if I'm doing that, and my, and my twin brother is doing the banking system, they say, well, I'm gonna do this banking system, but I don't like the vehicle you're using. So they're gonna have, they're gonna put in 10, and they're gonna have all 10 to use. And after a year, we're sitting down having lunch, and they're laughing at me, right? They're saying, you're stupid. And I say, okay, yeah, yeah, right now I am. You're starting first. The next year, I put in 10. I, I lose two of liquidity, okay, because I have eight to use. So now I've put in 20. I have 14 to use. Year three, I put in 10, and I have 10 to use, so I don't lose anything. Year four, I put in 10, so now I have 40,000 in. I'm starting to gain, right? And all of a sudden, my brother is saying, 
How did you do that? You put in a dollar and you had more than a dollar to use. How did, you didn't tell me that was going to happen. I thought you were really stupid. So the next year I put in a, a dollar, I gained three. Okay, so after five years, I'm, I'm still behind, but I'm close to every dollar that I put in, I've been able to use those dollars, right? The only place to do that is in a specifically designed life insurance contract, designed for privatized banking. And it's safe. It's the safest place to keep your money in America, out of the reach of the government, creditors, and uh, for the married people in, in, uh, in the room, we won't, and we won't mention that last one, okay? But not, it's not, this is not your, your Uncle Bob's State Farm policy, okay? It's not the New York Life guy that won't leave you alone or the Northwestern Mutual guy that tells you how great their dividends are. Let us manage your money. Because, by the way, those insurance companies are what? They're large financial institutions. What do financial institutions want? They want your, your money. How much of it do they want? How much of it do they want to give back to you at some point in time? As little as possible. The insurance company is no different, okay? But here's the thing is there's two different types of insurance companies. There's a stock company that are, that's owned by shareholders, and there's a mutual company that's owned by policyholders. So if we're going to use this money and use this account to hold our wealth to be the banker in our own lives, then there's no choice. We have to use a mutual company, right? It only makes sense that we'd want to own the company. So how does this process work? It's a great question. You have the insurance company, then you have this insurance contract, and it's growing, it's compounding, uninterrupted, every single day, guaranteed. Oh, by the way, it has a death benefit, so if some, you get hit by a truck, your family is going to be taken care of. It has some other riders for critical, chronic, terminal care, right? This is your cash value life insurance contract. Now, remember our paradigm. Remember this egg. Somewhere along the line, all of us have been told, don't put your money in here, right? Okay, so we have the insurance company. We know what we are looking for with the insurance company is we need a mutual company. Now, all that happens is we want to go and we want to purchase an asset. Maybe it's a cash flow asset. Maybe we want to use it for our business. We borrow money from the insurance company, they put a lien on our cash. Doesn't mean it go, doesn't go anywhere. It stays there and grows tax-free, tax-deferred, possibly tax-free, compounding every single day, guaranteed, right? And then we take it and we buy something. Let's say we're gonna buy a rental house, right? We get use and control of this asset, because that is an asset if, we, if it's cash flowing, and we get an interest-only loan non-structured. Unstructured loan. Meaning what? How many of your businesses have a, uh, a rhythm to them, a season, a up and down, right? So if, if it's a down season, we don't have to pay them anything we don't want to. We have to pay the interest. Okay, we, we're paying to use their money, just like the bank does to us, right? Okay, so, and by the way, every dollar of principal that comes back is available to use again, to turn again. And turns create what? Velocity. Now, by the way, 90% of insurance agents don't know this. They don't know that when you take a loan from your insurance contract, your money doesn't go anywhere. Isn't that funny? I mean, funny in a bad way. So this could work for Henry's, which I stole from Joe, which he probably stole that from Stan, which is... High earners, not rich yet. Is that true? Yeah, okay. Uh, business owners and medical professionals. All American families. Basically anybody. These people use it. Notice we have both sides of the aisle here, right? Every Fortune 500 company. Stan's going to talk about that later and show you examples of that. How about this guy? I think in your packet, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, is the Jim Harbaugh article and it says right here Michigan will all will loan Harbaugh four million bucks in 2016 an additional two million dollars for the following five years to pay the premium on a life insurance policy Harbaugh is allowed to borrow against the policy while he's living but has to keep at least 150 percent of the premium value untouched which gives the uh, school a cushion to make sure that they get their investment back 
pretty cool, right? Oops, I, oh, these, I'm sorry, these are the banks. These are banks' cash value. Now think about that, $21.3 billion. The smallest one is $6.4 billion. Why would the bank, how much money do you think they have in the stock market? Nothing, right? Why? Why would you put your money in the stock market when you could bank with it, when you could put it in an insurance contract where it has guaranteed growth, tax deferred, possibly tax free? $21.3 billion. Here's another cool thing. 25% of their tier one assets, that's all they can have in life insurance. The government regulates how much money they can have in their life insurance. Okay? I mean, why does the government regulate how much money we can have somewhere? Because it's a good deal, right? Because it's a cost to them. Now, by the way, about 53% of community banks have BOLI, bank-owned life insurance. So I was up in Minnesota, and I'm, and I'm uh, working with this owner of this bank, and it's his grandfather started it. He's uh, 35 years old, and he wanted to explain to me how banking worked, and I was kind of just going along, and, and he said, he was talking to me about fractional reserve banking, and, and he was saying, you know, Jim, if you deposit $100,000 in the bank, the next guy comes in, and they want to borrow a million dollars for a lake home, I can loan them the money based on your deposit. I said, yeah, I know that. And, and by the way, does everybody know that? Does that sound like, would you like to be able to do that in your business? Yeah, where do we sign up for that, right? Okay, so this guy says, he looks at me and he leans in and he whispers to me, he says, Jim, I win. I said, yeah, no, I get it, yeah. Um, and so then I started going through becoming your own banker and using privatized, the privatized banking to create wealth, using an insurance contract. And he said, so Jim, you're telling me in the 10th year, every dollar I put in, I have at least $1.50, maybe $2, depending on my age and, and underwriting class, to use? I said, yeah. He leans in again and he whispers and he says, Jim, I win. I said, I know, I'm trying to, yeah, that's why I'm showing you this, right? Okay. So how do I use this to become a wealth creator? Now, remember, I want to be all three of these entities. Now, remember what Joe said. This is 0.2%. This is what Bank of America is paying us. And what we pay them is 5.2. Doesn't seem sane or logical, right? So that means on a $10,000 deposit, they pay us 20 grand over a year. We pay them 5.2. Remember, if you've got, there's only one banking system in the world. If you've got money deposited at one bank and you're paying a loan at another bank, this is happening to you. They're making 2,600% more than you with your money. How many people are okay with that? I'm not okay with that. So what we do is we hold our money. This is a picture of my wife, Kelly, right back there. And uh, we hold our money in an insurance contract. We become the bank and we loan our money to ourselves, our companies, our family, or other people, if they have really, really good collateral, okay? And so the money flows from the saver, the depositor, the life insurance company, to us. We loan it to those people, pay interest back. Who controls these three entities? I do. I mean, we do, honey. And uh, who controls the money? We do. So don't work for your money, work for money. Make it work for you. Again, Stan, this is Stan's uh, graphics. You can kind of tell the difference, right? All right. So the, the last thing I'm going to do is we're going to do a 10-minute lesson on life insurance. All right. By the way, when you're done with this 10-minute lesson on life insurance, you're going to more, know more about really how to use a life insurance contract than 90% of life insurance agents out there. Okay? All right. So we just got to break it down. We get, if, it's, if you know what's happening, you'll know what to do. Right? So what's happening? Let's say you're going to buy a life insurance policy with a $500,000 death benefit, right? And there's a minimum premium that you could pay, and there's a maximum premium. Who sets the minimum premium? The that's right, the insurance company. Who sets the maximum premium? The government. That's right. Now, wait a minute. The government. Think about the minimum premium. Let me back up. What do they use? They use actuarial science, right? 
And the minimum premium is called what? It's called term insurance. But the fact that the government limits how much money we can put in an insurance contract says what? It's got to be good, right? More specifically, it has to be good in relationship to taxes. Because the government, they post, they, they, they publish a, all of the things in our lives that cost them money every year, right? Life insurance is on that list every single year. All right. There's a corridor between the minimum and the maximum. Outside of this corridor, now, by the way, the insurance company won't let you go this way, right? But outside of this corridor, then your insurance contract just became a modified endowment contract, or MEC, which means that it's going to act like a qualified plan. Now, we already, we already uh, covered qualified plans. It's going to have all the rules and regulations and related penalties. Now, the, we're going to get back to that in just a second, okay? But there's almost an infinite amount of premiums that can be charged between the minimum and the maximum. Actuaries calculate the, the least amount of premium that you can pay, and they can still make a profit. Now, if you think about this for a second, it's actuarial science. If you buy term insurance, are you betting with the insurance company or against them? Against, that's right. Because you're saying, I'm afraid I'm going to die. They're saying, we don't think so. They have law of large numbers. They have, they have selection. And if you called up a head actuary and you said, okay, I'm 52 years old. I graduated uh, my, graduation, uh, my high school graduation class of about 1,000 people. Okay, They will be able to tell me how many are still alive. Not about, they'll be able to tell me how many people are still alive because they have a big enough group or pool of people, right? So if you're betting against them when you buy turn insurance and they have actuarial science on their side, does that seem like a smart bet? No. So think about it. You're 35 years old, and you think somebody comes along and they say, hey, we want to sell you a big term life insurance contract. 30-year policy. I mean, look, you're going to be protected, and you're not going to need insurance after you're 65. I mean, come on. Right? You don't want to leave a legacy or anything like that. So you, what do you think your chances, if you can qualify for that policy at age 35, that your chances that you're going to die before 65? Less than 1%. What are your chances of dying after 65? 100%, right? Okay, so less than 1% of all term policies ever pay any premium because the only benefit that they can pay is what? A death benefit. So here's how you win with term insurance. You sign the application, you give them a check, and you go outside and get hit by a truck. That's a tough way to win, but that's how you beat the insurance company with term insurance. That's the only way to get any benefit, unless you're that lucky 1% that gets hit by a truck somewhere down in the future, right? Okay. Now, in the 80s, the government drew the line that determines the maximum amount of contributions allowable for a given death benefit death benefit, okay? Now, we know that we don't want to exceed that line because we don't want it to become a mech. We've already talked about that. So they accomplished this with two laws, DEFRA and TAMRA. So since 1988, right, they have restricted how much money that we can put in there. These two laws basically said the government can't just let people put unlimited amount of money in life insurance. If they do, then people might not put money where the government wants you to put money, which is where? Into, other than paying taxes, a qualified plan. All right, 401k, IRAs, SEPs, 403b plans, just to name a few. So what do qualified plans do? We already talked about this, but they defer the tax. And more importantly, they defer the tax calculation, right? So look, here's an example of that just to see if this makes sense to you guys. So let's say that you wanted to borrow $10,000. You'd ask two questions before you took the money. One, how much interest do I have to pay, right? When do I have to pay it back? So let's say the lender responds by saying, we have enough money right now. We don't really need any payments from you at this time. But there'll come a time when we do need the money. And when we know how much we need, we'll be able to tell you how much you owe. How many people are taking that loan, right? 
I mean, think about that. Would you cash that check? No, but that's what we do in our 401ks. Okay, so back to the insurance lesson. Okay, so let's assume you could pay $1,000 for that $500,000 of death benefit, or you could pay $10,000. Which one would you choose? A lot of people say, Thousand. Well, I want to pay. You know, I mean, because less is best when it comes to cost, right? So the lowest premium, that's known as term insurance, it provides one thing: death benefit. For the insurance company to expect you to put ten thousand dollars in something that you could get for a thousand, I mean, there'd have to be some serious benefits, right? So let's forget about insurance. Just putting your money somewhere. What are some of the benefits that you want to get. I mean, you want to maximize the number of benefits. You'd want the most benefit that you could get, right? So, in, I mean, in addition to getting a good rate of return, because we're always in our brains, we have, to, you know, we have to know that our paradigm is hard to break. So we always want to go back and say, yeah, but what's the rate of return? So in addition to getting the rate of return, okay? If you could ma wave a magic wand, what benefits would you desire? Would you want the money in the account to grow tax deferred as opposed to taxable? Sure. Would you want tax-free distributions? Absolutely. Now, again, I know that I've already, for, for us that have a 401k, I've already pretty much told you that your baby's ugly, right? But, but I'm going to say it a little bit uglier because, because of this. Think about this. We talk about retirement. By the way, what's the definition of retirement? To take out a service. Does everybody want to be taken out of service? No. I don't. So think about retirement like climbing a mountain. Is the goal to get to the top of the mountain? Or is it to get down the mountain safely? Get down, right? So this is the accumulation phase. This is the distribution phase. By the way, who is the first person to climb Mount Everest? Well, yeah, but he wasn't sir when he climbed it, right? He was only sir when he came down successfully. And by the way, he wasn't the first one to get to the top of the mountain. 30 years before that, and I can always, never remember this guy's name because nobody does, is there was a guy that got to the top of the mountain. What happened to him on the way down? He froze. He didn't get knighted, right? He wasn't sir anybody, right? Edmund Hillary was the hero because he got down the mountain safely. So when we look at our Wall Street accounts and we start taking distribution, what percentage can we take? Using the Monte Carlo method, three to four percent. So for every million dollars that you accumulate, you can get thirty, forty thousand dollars. Taxable at what rate? I don't know. Who knows? So would you want tax-free distributions? Yeah, absolutely. Of course we want a competitive rate of return. Do we want to make large contributions? If I could put in $40,000 and I can have $77,000 to use, don't I want to put four hundred dollars or $4 million in there? How about additional benefits like free long-term care coverage? Does anybody have a long-term care policy? What if you could have it part of your insurance contract where you could use the death benefit if you became terminally ill or chronically ill or critically ill. How about protected from creditors? I mean, if you own a business, I mean, we have insurance and everything, but I mean, it doesn't mean somebody can't sue us, right? How about collateral opportunities? Want to use it as collateral? By the way, the insurance cash value, 100% available for collateral. Bond account, 80% stocks. 50%, approximately. Why stocks only 50%? Because they know you could lose, right? They know that you can lose. Why 100% in the life insurance? Because you can't lose. So you want your money to be safe, right? And no loss provision. I just kind of beat that one up. You can't lose any money. And you'd want guaranteed loan provisions, meaning you can't be denied access to your money. Now think about this. If the bank came and said, hey, you know, you've got a great business. We're going to give you a lifetime contract, which means from now on, we're going to, we're going to establish your interest rate right now, okay? And we're going to uh, guarantee you 
that you can take out up to 100% of your money minus the interest that you would pay between now and the anniversary date of that, of that deposit or that, that policy. Guaranteed. You don't have to call us and ask for, tell us your FICO score or fill out an application. You don't even have to have a job. And we are obligated to give you the money. If the bank did that, how many of you would change your loans right now to that? Everyone, right? How about the unstructured payments? Do you get to decide? You're in control instead of the bank. Would you want to have liquidity, use, and control of your money? That's what the bank wants. How about deductible contributions? Well, sure, if we could get them, right? You'd want the maximum amount of those benefits, right? Everybody in the room, right? Which of these benefits do you get with a qualified plan? Well, tax deferred, hopefully a competitive rate of return, and deductible contributions. There's only one product that offers the majority of these benefits, and that's a specifically designed whole life insurance policy with, from a mutual company. Now remember, it's specifically designed. You can't just go buy this from somebody that got their insurance license in two weeks and doesn't have 40 years experience on how to show you how to use this. Okay, permanent insurance contracts, they offer every one of those benefits except for the deductible contributions if it's outside of a qualified plan. Now, not just any insurance contract will do. Minimally funded is minim minimum levels of benefit. Okay, so as you move from the highest possible contributions to the lowest, you diminish the value of your benefits. The higher the premium, the higher the level of each benefit until you reach that max line. Never above it, but right up to it, okay? The greatest amount of benefits, while still allowing liquidity use and control of your money. If you pass that line, you lose that. For infinite banking or privatized banking, you have to use a paid up additions rider to get as close to that MEC line as possible. Making your policy as efficient as possible. Okay, right to that line. All right, so after that 10 minutes, I promise you, you know more about life insurance than 90% of life insurance agents out there and how to use this. Andrew, you're shaking your head, right? I mean, you go around training guys all over the country. How many people know that they are just your average run-of-the-mill life insurance people? Very few. Not Alpha Omega Wealth that have, this is what they do. They show people every day. This is what they do in their personal lives. This is how they built their wealth. They do it, right? Just like Nike said, just do it. Okay, so designing this policy. Well, first we have to understand a little bit about life insurance. It has to be designed to be a bank, okay? So the, let's look at life insurance in general from an efficiency standpoint. We're going to look at this as the line of efficiency. On the left side is the most efficient, let's just say it's a dollar for dollar, okay? So I put in a dollar, I have a dollar of cash that I could take, which means I have zero cost, and I have a dollar or so death benefit, right? No cost. By the way, this is what stockbrokers sold from around 1980 to 88. They sold more of this than life insurance agents ever thought about selling. Because you could put 100 grand into a policy, have $100,000 of cash value, had nothing at risk, right? This is why the government changed those rules. But, um, I mean, crazy. People were taking money and putting them into these contracts that are called a universal life chassis, which is a separate account. So you have your your mortality expense, and you have your insurance costs, and then you have the separate bucket that you're trying to accumulate money in, right? Really what these do is they transfer the risk to you, the consumer. Now remember, the insurance company, they have actuarial science, they have actuaries, they have large numbers, they have selection, they have all this stuff, transfers it to you. Which of those things do you have? Zero, right? So we don't advise people to use those kinds of contracts for banking. And again, the government said, hey, that's not life insurance. We're, not gonna, we're, gonna, we're going to classify it as a modified endowment contract, right? Acts like a qualified plan. We don't like that. Okay, 
on the other side of the least efficient type of policy is over here on this side of the efficiency line. Now I put in a dollar, I have a zero dollars that I can use. I could put in a million dollars, I have zero dollars I can use. I have a ton of death benefit though, right? But what's that called? That's term insurance. I don't ever get any money to use of the dollars that I put in. It's all cost. Now, in here would be just a regular whole life policy not designed for banking. You know, uh, over here would maybe be universal life, variable universal life, index universal life. All those would be somewhere in here. The whole life would, would outperform that over time. But we use this one pay policy that's not available anymore, but it is available as a rider. Okay? And we can get almost over here. This is that, where that MEC line would be in my other example. And we can't cross it because, again, if it, we cross that line, it becomes taxable. So we want to get as close to that MEC line as possible without crossing it okay, to design the policy. That way it's the most efficient cash in, cash available to use possible. So let's say a $50,000 premium. About 60% of that premium can be in the paid-up additions. Now, by the way, I'm just using round numbers because, you know, we have lots of different ages, underwriting classifications, etc. cetera. So um, about 60% goes in there and about 40% goes into the base policy. Now, by the way, I'm going to show you why Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman hate whole life. And I'm going to show you why in the beginning they may have a point, but in the end they're really, really wrong. Okay? So... The first year, I said about 60%, so 30,000 goes into this paid up additions. And I have 30,000 I can take out. What's my cost? Zero. Next year I put in 30, the next year I put in 30. I could go and run out of screen, it's always the dollar for dollar. No leveraging, right? On the base policy, I put in 20,000. The most I'm gonna have is like 5,000, right? And Susie and Dave, they say, look at that, that's a terrible investment. Next year I put in 20, I might have 18 or less. The next year I put in 20, let's say I don't even have 20 yet, right? Now, most of the contracts that Alpha Omega uses, by the third and fourth year, every dollar that goes in is going to be worth a dollar or more that you can use. So right there... Every dollar that goes in, a dollar you have a dollar to use, right? No leveraging, but no cash drag. This is the cash drag right here. This is the drag to get started. By the fifth year, I put in 20, I have 25 to use. Now I'm leveraging. Every year after that, it only gets better. In, in the tenth year, again, I'm using pretty much kind of minimum numbers. I put in 20, I have 35 to use. So... That 20, would I want that 20 at that point to be 20 or 200 or 2 million? And if I had a business that was flowing money, was coming into my business, wouldn't I want to, at that point, every dollar that comes into my business, I'd want to flow through here? Well, do you want to start first or do you want to finish first? Because if, again, my twin brother does this in their checking account, they look really good for the first three years. But life's a marathon, right? Who cares who's leading the marathon after five miles? It's after 26.2 miles, right? The other thing is, think about this, is there's never been a photo finish in an Olympic marathon. Why? Because over time, we all kind of spread out. Our decisions determine what results we get. So the better decisions we can make with our money, we have to think long term. We have to think like rich people. We have to think like the banks, right? We can't get focused on, hey, in the first two years I'm behind. I don't care because I know the 10 years coming, right? So uh, this just reminds me of uh, one of the greatest sermons I ever heard that it was really simple. He says, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Okay, now, for, for people who are Christians, you know, Friday is the crucifixion, Sunday is the resurrection, right? It might be year one, but I know year 10's coming, right? 
I know it's coming. It's not, I can't mess this up. It's guaranteed. All I have to do is make good decisions and be an honest banker. I can do that. Okay. So Susie and Dave, do you think they know this? Obviously they don't or they don't know how to do math. Okay. So designing this insurance contract. There's moving parts, it's complicated, but it's flexible. This is flexible. I said that businesses have a rhythm. Do businesses have bad years sometimes? Sure. But businesses also have a windfall, have windfalls, right? So think about this. You're using all this money, and it's out making you more money, and you have a windfall. Where are you going to put it? In a checking account where it's going to be taxed, and it's not going to grow? No, you're going to put it back in here, right? And the more, you have to have a series of these policies. And I'm going to talk about that this afternoon. And Stan, I think, is going to talk about that as well. You need a series of policies. Because if you had a bank, do you want more money flowing through your bank or less money flowing through your bank? This isn't because Alpha Omega wants you to have all the insurance contracts in the world. They want you to control the banking function in your life. Because they know by doing that, you, your family, and your business is going to be way better off than without that. And you think about that slide that Joe showed about the family being the center of your wealth building. What's the alternative? Compared to what? Compared to giving your money to the Wall Street people and letting them erode your wealth? Risk your wealth? No. I mean, you, this is the way to build wealth. So. When I, when I, does this make sense to everybody? That, there, that the way that you have to design the contract, it takes time? So let's think about this. All of these dollars that are growing in here, they're growing tax deferred, possibly tax free, right? How about if you take this money, the insurance company's money, and you use it for your business? Any CPAs in the room? No? Um, I'm not a CPA. I don't give tax advice. I know Joe and his team, don't, they don't give tax advice. So, but is it possible that if you pay interest to the insurance company and you use it for a business reason that it could be deductible? Absolutely. So think about this. How many things in your life is the money that you're earning growing tax-free and the money you're paying is deductible? Not very many, right? Not very many. So. Again, the process is you're going to have this insurance contract, and it's going to be growing, uninterrupted, guaranteed, tax-deferred. And the reason I say tax-deferred and possibly tax-free is because when you start to take the money out, we can get that money to be tax-free. We just got to do it the right way. We got, to, we got to manage that. Then you're going to use this insurance company's money to go buy assets. Okay, so when you buy a cash flow asset, the people in the room that are Kiyosaki fans, you know, when you're buying, when you're doing real asset investing, real estate, businesses, etc., and you earn a dollar, let's say that you don't need that dollar right now, you don't need that income, what are you going to do with it? Put it back in your checking account? Well, if you have a banking system like this, Every dollar that goes back to the insurance company frees up another dollar from the lien that they're putting on my, my account. It frees it up for me to use again. To do what? To go buy more assets. So it's really kind of a philosophy. Is if I'm, if I'm a W-2 worker and, and, and I'm being told that I need retirement, that I need to build a retirement pool of money, by the way, I'm told this, that the company is going to help me do it, right? They're going to match. They're going to do all this stuff. But the government's going to control my money, and I don't know the consequences, the tax consequences down in, in the future. But I'm told that's what I should do with my money. Now, Robert Kiyosaki would call that what? Would that be his rich dad or his poor dad's advice? Poor dad. The rich dad's advice is to create financial independence. So it doesn't matter how old you are. If you were 35 years old and, you ha and, and let's say 
your lifestyle was five hundred thousand dollars i'm using big numbers because i you know you want to think of it as if i had a million dollars a year coming in twice as much as i think that i need to have the lifestyle that i want would i go to work the next day well not if i didn't want to that's financial independence financial independence doesn't have an expiration retirement does or possibly it does because when you retire and you have a pool of money and you're going to live off that money for the rest of your life, is that stressful or stress-free? Stressful. Because you're hoping that you don't take bad advice. You're hoping that somebody doesn't rip you off. You're hoping that something doesn't change in the taxes. And, and I have a funny story, I, uh, and, I, and I use a lot of doctor stories. Just like, I, I, um, like I said, my, my neighborhood's full of doctors, so a lot of my friends happen to be doctors. So one day I'm explaining this, and I said, the money that you have in this retirement account, this is a, um, a, a doctor's wife, I said, is it possible that when you get to that age that because you've done so well, they have some kind of excise tax or, or some kind of tax, they're going to tax you more than other people? And she said, she said, Jim Oliver, the American people would never let the government do that to us. And I said, Kathy, you pay more in taxes than 99% of the United States makes. If they, they'll be cheering in the streets to take your money. And she said, I think you're right. <laughs> right? Now, I'm going to steal one of Nelson Nash's stories. Because I think that Nelson, Nelson would probably say, Jim, you butchered that story. Now, Nelson, for you people that, for you guys in the room that have, uh, have read the book, he's 86 years old. He's a brilliant, brilliant man, and he's a, he's a great mentor to, to me, to Joe, to Joe's whole team, right? Even our families uh, all love Nelson. Nobody that I've ever met doesn't love Nelson. So Nelson says, um, all right, let's say that you and I are in, a, in, the, in the mall in a food court, and I come up to you, and I, and I um, grab you and put a gun to your head and say, give me your money. And everybody in the food court stops, it gets really quiet, they, they gasp, and they say, oh my gosh, Jim is Robin Nelson, right? And, um, and, and so, okay, th that's what most people think would happen, right? But let's change, up, change it up a little bit. So let's say that I get there before Nelson, and I, and I get everybody's attention in the food court, and I say, hey, in just a few minutes, this guy, Nelson Nash, is going to come in. And I'm just telling you, this guy's got too much money. He doesn't need all this money. And I'm sure that he's taking advantage of us. He's got too much money. So Nelson comes in. Again, I grab him. I put a gun to his head, tell, me to, tell him to give me all of his money. Now, instead of everybody gasping with shock, they're cheering me on. Because what do I tell them? Oh, yeah, by the way, I'm going to share all of his money with you guys. So the American people will tax the crap out of us if the government sells it the right way. Which, how do they do that? This is a tax on the rich, right? Are all business owners rich? Do all business owners um, just, I mean, we take the risk. We build the business. We do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week at times. We should be rewarded. If somebody says, hey, I don't want to do that, that's their choice, right? So Joe talked about money not being wealth. And one of the things that I like to say is, and if my kids were here, they would, they, they're almost tired of hearing this, is money gives you choices. Choices give you freedom. Therefore, money equals freedom, right? I agree money is not wealth. But if we are going to have, through our lifetime, plenty of money flow through our hands. And the key is to keep it and get it to work for us for generations from now and generations into the future. Then all we have to do is learn this process. And again, that's the great thing is a lot of people around the country talk about this. But they don't really know how to do it. They don't do it. I like these young guys in, in Utah. They say, financial independence in 10 years or less. Are you financially independent? No. Okay, how are you going to teach me how to do that? 
That's like me getting up here and saying, let me show you how to run a marathon in, in two hours or less. Well, Jim, can you do that? No, I cannot. So I'm not going to teach you about that. But I do banking. I do this, and I'll show you later uh, this afternoon some of the results that I've gotten doing this. Stan's going to show you the results. He's doing this. He's living this. Joe Pantosi and his family live this. His whole team. There's nobody on his team that doesn't do this. Okay, so we, I think we have a few minutes, Joe. Should we have some questions or anything that you guys want to see? You want me to back up and, and go back through any of the numbers or anything like that? Because I'm transparent. I'll show you my policies. I'll show, Joe will show you his policies. Stan's going to show you his policies, right? There's no, this is not marketing. This is, this is just, this is wealth building and, and math. So any questions or any examples? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you have 5,000 to use. Now, I say 5,000 or less because there's some policies that are, um, that are 20,000 and you have no dollars to use, right, on the base side. And by the way, there's no free lunch and insurance. If I take from you in the beginning, I can give to, to you in the end. And if I, get, if, I, if I give to you in the beginning, I have to take from you in the end. It's all actuarial science. It's all math. So it, what I care about is year three, four, five, and beyond, right? And by the way, remember when we looked at that example of the $10,000 policy, and I said you put in 40 and you had 77 to use? Well, we already know at year four I'm behind. So it's not how great of an investment this is. Banking is a process, not a product. This is the best place to put it long term, that's why we use it. But there is a cost in the beginning to get this thing up and running. But trust me, over time, it doesn't, that doesn't matter. Yes? So you have a death benefit, right? And let's say you had a, uh, let's just, and, use that example, you had a million dollars of death benefit, you had a $200,000 loan. So you haven't paid back $200,000 of you, your loan, you pass away, your family's gonna get $800,000. By the way, tax, what? Free, right? So, you know, here's the way that I look at it, is when, in, and I think Stan would, would echo this, is there's no way I'd buy as much death benefit as I have on me if I wasn't using my cash like this, right? I make a joke and I tell, and I, and I stole this joke, because Joe and Evie and these guys have heard this a bunch of times, as I say, try to, honey, if something happens to me, try to look sad at the funeral, <laughs> right? Because the death benefit, you know, I could borrow half my death benefit and they're still gonna be perfectly happy and fine, right? But remember, I don't only get the death benefit, but all of the things that we're buying, and we use it to buy businesses and real estate and everything else, all of those things, those aren't gonna go away when I die. That's creating the legacy. So the death benefit's part of the legacy, but I'm also in a way, I'm leveraging that death benefit and that cash value to create a bigger legacy that's diversified. It's not all just sitting in my life insurance contract. It's this real estate project, this business, that's true diversity, or diversification, I should say. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just answering questions because I know that I kind of got, got done faster than, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's a great question. So the insurance company, some companies charge you a fixed interest rate. Some companies charge you a variable interest rate. Okay, there's some companies that are direct recognition, non-direct recognition. Now, for our purposes today, th that just those are details that sitting down one-on-one -on -one with your advisor from Alpha Omega will, they'll explain that. But in, on page 69 and 70, Nelson shows you an example of, that answers your question. And in the beginning, you, in, in the, and I'm going to go through this example, but what I would say is, is that ultimately the money is going to go to your benefit ultimately over time, okay? 
but the insurance company is charging you interest. Remember, it's interest only. And the way that I look at it is this, is, um, and I'll just give you an example. One of my businesses um, two weeks ago, we had a, we had a $170,000 uh, deal that we could get, right? All we had to do was move something from this town to this town. They had already given us a deposit. We already had the signed purchase order, everything else. But we needed $130,000 just for a week. Okay, because they had given us a deposit. That's why 130 instead of the 170. So uh, the company paid me $2,000 for one week to use my 130 grand, which I got out of one of my insurance contracts, right? That's 114% annually when you do the math. So when I look at it and I think, what the insurance company charged me? I don't care, right? I don't care because my opportunity to either save interest or to make interest far outweighed that. But, I'll, but I'm going to go through an example and show you how the velo using the money over and over again outweighs any, any drag from that interest, but also how the interest is paid back. And, it will, and maybe we'll even go through, depending on time, that page 69 or 70. And if, if not, I know that uh, Joe or, or one of his guys will, when I say guys, by the way, I mean men or women, um, will go through that uh, with you exactly. Okay? That's, that's a great question. So what, what, um, it's whatever, what, this is the way that I answer that. Now this is, the, that depends, what the, the right answer is it depends on what your CPA thinks, right? Because your CPA will give you their opinion on that. But what I do, and Joe, you can, you can pipe in on what you do, but what I try to do is I, is I keep it customary or reasonable, right? But a lot of the loans that I use, they're unsecured when I loan it to myself. So what is an unsecured loan interest that, that would be reasonable? Well, it would be reasonable that if I didn't do this, I could put it on a credit card. So I think if I'm charging myself 10 or 12%, that I'm no problem, right? Now, I use the same CPA as Joe does, and, and CPAs always argue with you a little bit, right? You expect them to have a little bit of pushback. But that's what I would say. Now, if you could go down and you could get a car, let's say you could buy a truck from your business. And, and GMAC is going to charge you seven, well, then I think you're kind of stretching it to say I'm going to charge myself 14, right? But reasonable and customary. So, but, but what we're going to show later is, let's say you're getting seven. You're just charging yourself seven on that. But then every dollar that comes back in, you're using again, so, and you're buying another truck at seven, right? So now your money, you saw the first loan, you have the second loan, maybe you have a third loan, maybe a fourth loan, and for businesses, all of a sudden, that interest rate on one individual loan is not as important as the system and the stacking effect and creating that velocity of money. Does that make sense?